And the first thing I learned is that when you're working with really talented people, uh, you know, you, you can't strangle them. You have to sort of give them the space to think. You have to give them the space to experiment and play. And I think with, with really motivated and talented mm -hmm. people, if you sort of give them autonomy and purpose, uh, you can sort of get true creativity out of them. Hi, Keith. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Hi, thank you for having me. I feel like you're like an overachiever because you listed like basically all your accomplishment at like Waterloo. Then like you're like the president of like the clubs and then like you were, you know, winning this like the first self-funded undergraduated nanorobotics team in Canada. And then like, you know, you work on multiple products and functions at Facebook, such as like the Facebook Android, Graph Search, Notification. And at Instagram, you're running this like, you know, message and messaging and then like camera AR team. Team, uh, AR products. And then as Citizen, you're like the head of product and then helping the company 10x their active user. And later on, you become an entrepreneur at like Gridlock and where you, you incubate it like Tom. Like, you know, the first question is like, you know, how do you come, like, how do you start it? And then how did you get to where you are? And what is Narno Robotics? Maybe I'll answer that question first <laughs> and then I can tell you a little bit of, of the story. Um, so there's a uh, this robotics competition mm -hmm. that's held every year. It's called RoboCup. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of the really nerdy and technical schools love to put uh, teams into this competition. And it, it originally started with really large robots that could play soccer, sort of like mm -hmm. human-sized robots, and then sort of smaller robots and smaller mm -hmm. robots. And then one year they were like, we should have a soccer competition for a robot that you know is about as thick as a human hair. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, I was studying um, nanophysics at the time. I was like, this sounds awesome. I've always wanted to build a robot. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I'm only learning things at this really tiny scale. Um, so I was like, I'd love to build, you know, a really tiny robot that can mm -hmm. play soccer, that can grab this little silicon disc and sort of mm -hmm. move it into the, the net. And it was actually um, a lot of where I learned about fundraising, because mm -hmm. uh, when I wanted to start the project, the um, uh, the school didn't want to fund it. They were like, your grades aren't good enough, mm -hmm. or you don't think you have a good enough plan. So I had to go and get sponsorship from different companies that were trying to hire computer mm -hmm. science students in Waterloo. Um, so I worked on it for years. And then, uh, you know, our first year, we, we did really poorly. Our, our third year, we ended up winning the competition. And then um, the year after that, when I left, the, the team ended up breaking a bunch of records mm -hmm. for this tiny robot that could play soccer. So it was a mm -hmm. really interesting lesson in, in entrepreneurship. Okay, so how did the nano robotics place into the fact that like, you know, you were running like successful products? So is there like some particular lesson that you've learned like during that age to like, like, you know, um, help you like jumpstart your like product career. And then obviously, like, you know, you've worked on like the big tech company product like Facebook and like, you know, which, you know, any kind of like smaller changes would like impact like, millions of people. And then you've also like right now you kind of like built something from scratch. What were something that you kind of took from like your early on? experience that kind of like impacted you too, I'd say. I'd say a couple of things, but the first thing was that I was able to recruit these really smart students to come work on this robot with me. And the first thing I learned is that when you're working with really talented people, uh, you know, you, you can't strangle them. You have to sort of give them the space to think, you have to give them the space to experiment and play. And I think with, with really motivated and talented mm -hmm. people, if you sort of give them autonomy and purpose, uh, you can sort of get true creativity out of them. But you know, every time I tried to, to overly micromanage their work, or I tried mm -hmm. to, to sort of be, be a little bit of an agitator, uh, you know, the, the results were always worse. So I think I learned mm -hmm. something about, um, about management very early on. The other thing I learned is that when you're building a really, really tiny robot, um, or, or really a tiny anything you can't really deal with a lot of complexity because mm -hmm. uh if you make a little mistake you have to throw away the thing that you made and start again from scratch um so my first version of it was really complicated and we mm -hmm. we could never even test the idea because we couldn't build the thing uh mm -hmm. and it was sort of this this forced learning about 
do the simple thing first, which actually mm -hmm. was a, a, a value in Instagram when, mm -hmm. when I joined and certainly true of the products as well. Um, it, it's actually very easy to think of something complicated mm -hmm. and it requires a lot of like hard refinement to make something simple and to make something uh, reduced. Um, so mm -hmm. I feel like this was a big learning from the physical world that I brought into the digital world and a, mm -hmm. a lot of about product and you know maybe the, the last thing I would say is um you know much like entrepreneurship you know I, I feel like that the job of the CEO is getting mm -hmm. you know multiple rejections a day right from uh people who you you'd like to recruit to the company for investors mm -hmm. for customers that don't like your product and you know finding a way to get up the next morning and do the exact same thing and uh, <laughs> and i felt like that was sort of the, the case with this rope you know we had built 40 or 50 different versions of it um before one of them really worked uh, so it was sort of a uh, an accelerated learning into uh, the, the value of persistence. Yeah, that's like some really great lessons there. I mean, when you say you're getting rejected, I almost couldn't believe it because, you know, just by looking at the product, it looks really beautiful. And like, you know, by looking at the investor, you guys literally have like, you know, who don't you have, you know, the, the father of LinkedIn, Dan Rose or like. Eric Schmidt, they're like literally the top like operator turn investors. Out of curiosity, like, you know, among all these people, like who is on your personal board of advisors when it comes to like career development? Well, I um, I was very lucky in some ways in the sense that uh, yeah, I was able to join Facebook at a time when there were really a lot of thoughtful people who joined. And then mm -hmm. a few years later, they all left and decided to go and, and, and create other things and uh, become investors. And, and that certainly helped. You know, for, to your question of who's on my, my personal board of advisors, I'm not sure that I have, uh, you know, a personal board of advisors. I, I have my fiance who I uh, ask, get, get advice on everything from. Uh, but, but for the most part, I, I sort of have this view that's, um, there's a lot of people that have distinct expertise in something and it's very important to be able to reach out to those people for the, the, the sort of like area of expertise or, or zone of genius um but i think it's, it's very hard to picture someone who's just like unequivocally good at everything right but, um mm. so more than anything i've got a group of, of folks who i reach out to when i have crazy machine learning ideas and have a group of, of, of you know ceos who i might call sometimes to ask about leadership decisions and then you know i've got a group of product designers or a group of investors who i get advice from for that sort of thing and i've started to build this model of when i have to learn something new which is kind of my, my job these days it's always learning a new role doing it myself then eventually hiring or convincing someone to do it for me. I, I found that I, I created this recipe of, uh, you know, form an opinion, go and talk to three to five people to sort of like um, refine that opinion, then stop talking to people, develop a new opinion, and then try it out. So I've, I've been thinking about these sort of micro networks of expertise, uh, you know, as, uh, as I've been going on this journey. In terms of like skills, like, you know, you turn yourself like from a person who was like in engineering to a product manager to right now, like running your own company as a CEO. What do you feel like was one skill that you're constantly trying to get better at? It could be like a technical skill, like a coding or like stuff like that, or like a soft skill like sales. So I'll, I'll give you a, a hard skill and a soft skill. I would say for a hard skill, um, I am trying to play catch up in machine learning right now we're just to, to say that I, I felt like i was wrapping my head around what was possible mm -hmm. um 10 years ago with ranking recommendations and search and i feel mm -hmm. like sort of turned a page in the past two years and mm -hmm. as soon as i think i've caught up the next morning i wake up and i'm mm -hmm. falling behind so you know i'm doing a lot of editing of this is how i see the world this is what's possible and just sort of constantly refining that it's been very very useful for for tone the other thing that i've been trying to trying to get better at skill wise it's honestly truly being able to be present um which mm -hmm. is to say that you know uh if you if i look at my meeting schedule today or this week parts of it are about finance parts of it are about recruiting go to market folks parts of it are product reviews parts of it are like thinking about acquisition and um and i found that if i carry 
those thoughts from meeting to meeting. You know, mm -hmm. I can't be effective uh, because it's, it's a total context switch. I mean, to, to me, it, it almost that sounds like um, being a veterinarian. You're seeing a dog and then a cat and then a, uh, <laughs> a chicken and a, and a bird. Um, so I'm trying really hard to um, sort of leave thoughts at the end of a meeting uh, purge and then sort of show up to, to a new meeting focused and not thinking about the previous one. When you were like creating the company or incubating the company while you were at Gridlock and like what were you know what do you identify as your personal unfair advantage and then how does that translate into like the company that you're creating uh it's a good question I can think about it in a few different ways <laughs> um one I, I I think if you're if you're thinking about starting a company of your own um one of the things that became really obvious to me is that um, I'm gonna have to pitch this company uh 10 times every day for the rest of my life right mm -hmm. and um when, when you think about you know, what does it take to be excited and enthusiastic to, to, to pitch that same thing over and over and over again, you know, with perfect recall and perfect <laughs> precision? Um, I think the, the first and most important thing is that you need to be like deeply curious and fascinated with that problem space and the people whom you serve, mm -hmm. because it is all you're going to pitch and it's all you're going to think about, you know, mm -hmm. for a good chunk of your adult life. And, um, and I think if, uh, if you truly are enamored and excited and enthusiastic about um, the space that you're in, then I, I think the, the rest becomes easy. So mm -hmm. for me in particular, I've always been fascinated by communication. And this is sort of the, the arc of my, my work, even, even at Facebook. I, I worked, um, first of all, a search product, which I think about as communication mm -hmm. machines uh, and getting machines to give you what you want. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I worked on, you know, the, the Instagram camera or uh, or DMs on Instagram, and uh, I was always fascinated with, um, mm -hmm. you know, why are why do people like to talk to each other? Why are they afraid of talking to each other? What what inhibits them from sharing their face in the morning? Um, mm -hmm. If you have a crush on someone, what what do you use to break the ice? So when I was, you know, thinking through different ideas, I knew that I wanted to work on a communication company. And, um, and, and a little part of me was thinking, well, I know something about communication in the sense that I, um, I, I had worked on it before, but um, I sort of had this burning desire to want to work on the communication of ideas, mm -hmm. which is to say that um, myself, plus all of the people that have worked on all of these camera products and social networks, we've made it really easy to share your face to share what you're eating, to share what you're doing on a weekend. But, you know, if you want to share something in your head, we actually don't have a great medium for that. You know, you, mm -hmm. you either have to like record a podcast or you have to mm -hmm. make a PowerPoint or you have to re like write a really long document that no one's mm -hmm. going to read. And kept thinking, oh, I would love to like reinvent how people share mm -hmm. ideas so that it can be clearer. And I just got really, really captivated with that problem. And I got excited about the people who I would serve in the sense that, the, 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 you know, the people who Tone serves are people that have ideas that they want to share. They want their boss to give them the chance to build them. They want uh, investors to give them money so that they can build them, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they, mm -hmm. they want to write a story to sort of captivate people. And it's like, that's that sound, those sound like people who I'd like to serve for a really mm -hmm. long time. So that's sort of how Tone started. And mm -hmm. then, you know, once I, I, I sort of tapped into this is a thing that I want to work on for the next you know, 10, 20, 30 years, um, a lot of the thinking was, well, how can we turn this into a company? You know, I, I come from social networks. So my first thought was, oh, can we build like a medium for visual ideas? Mm -hmm. and very quickly learned that's a very hard business to build. And, and, uh, and also it's a very like, it's a, it's a business where the incentives aren't all aligned in, mm -hmm. in the sense that if you build an ads business, you just need people to create more and more and mm. more because you want to feed ads into the, the, the viewers. Or if you build something just for consumers, um, you might not be able to build really complex things uh, that connect to different data sources or really expensive things that use a lot of compute. So a lot of my thinking was I want to you know, be in the space, but how do I build something that can eventually turn into an enterprise company? Uh, so that was a lot of the work that I was doing at Greylock and sort of editing and shaping the idea. How did you kind of like stumble upon this product? You mentioned like there was like 40, 50 revision. So at the beginning, did you just like, I guess like how do you, like what do 
you guys build at the very, very beginning and then like how did it evolve into where it is today? And then when it comes to thinking about like a product and a business, like I think it needs like two of your very different brain. Like I feel like for a product, you need like the design or like really creative brain. And then like in terms of making money, eventually I feel like that's like what will convince people to, you know, give you money in a way. So how do you kind of like think about like what kind of product we need to build? And then what are some like factors you have to cons- take into consideration? And like, how do I turn that into like a company? Yeah, let me see if I could, if I could answer that. <laughs> uh, the, the first thing was that I, I had this little bit of this contrarian view. You know, you, most people tell you that the first person who you bring into a company should be a technical co-founder. You know, I, I have a little bit of a contrarian take on it. It's like, do the first person that I want to bring into the company and co-found this with should help me like imagine and shape the product that we want. Mm-hmm. And I think once we know exactly what we want to build, then we can you know, hire a team to build it rather than prematurely just bringing someone to think about, well, like, uh, let's build something, but we don't quite know what it is. Mm-hmm. Um, so I ended up finding Henry, my co-founder, through um, mm-hmm. honestly just a, a mutual friend. And um, we, we spent a lot of our the first few months of Tome working honestly, with Reed uh, at Raylock and, and sort of sketching and, and imagining what we want this thing to look like. Mm-hmm. Uh, but by we, I mean, Henry, he's the one that can draw and has the, the hard design and mm-hmm. product skills. But, um, you know, we had both worked on mobile for a while. So uh, he sort of designed a mobile prototype of Tome. And it felt crazy, right, to, to imagine if you use like notion or canva or powerpoint or uh to see this like mobile first productivity tool and it was very Mm -hmm. interesting to a lot of people so we ended up showing it to our friends it was a non-working prototype it was just an idea but we ended up showing it to 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 read our friends that worked at these companies and they're all this is really interesting if you could figure out how to build this i mean we, we would probably pay for it so then we we went on the search uh we found our, our founding engineering team and they they were really really uh excited to build the first version of it and then we, mm-hmm. we both had this belief that build the simple thing first and like wait for customers to tell us what else they need and that way we'll know that we haven't built anything mm-hmm. wasteful um, just mm-hmm. one sort of like, um, I would say one, uh, one thing to be afraid of in this space is that you, you accidentally spend five years rebuilding all of PowerPoint and you never actually get to product market fit. Mm-hmm. Right? Uh, so we have this view of like, let's build the tiniest thing that we know will work and then sort of iterate on it. So that's mm-hmm. the first version of Tome. You could only have two tiles next to each other. It was um, it was a text tile and you know an image tile or something. And we we're like, let's try this two tile only thing for page mm-hmm. and see how far people get. And of course, people didn't get very far. Every team that we <laughs> uh, that we onboarded, but they were like, I, I need to put three things on a page. Um, so then we were like, okay, let's start to evolve the system so we could put you know, more things on a page. And then we, we build that and then we get heard feedback of this is cool, but I need to be able to theme and brand my, my tone because that's what my company needs. So then we built mm-hmm. theming and branding and we just kept iterating and iterating with a small group of people until we started to create something that's, uh, that I think a lot of people wanted to use. I'm curious, like when you first started, like, do you imagine like, okay, so we're going to solve like the biggest problem in the world. And then like, we're going to like, just like make a changing PowerPoint. And like, how, like at the beginning, what were your vision for like the future of work? And like, how did it shape you into like iterating your product through, you know, following that vision? So Henry and I talk all the time about how if we were building this company in 2030, um, mm-hmm. I mean, we would just be building something using Neuralink, right? Because in a, in a perfect mm-hmm. world, you should be able to like connect your brain mm-hmm. to the person whom you want to tell the story to and just pass everything sort of in full fidelity. Uh, but we're like, you know, we're not there yet. So what can we build with with software on screens before we get there? And, uh, you know, he was really enamored by the sort of idea of like a magical tome. You know, mm-hmm. if you play a lot of uh, RPG games, the, mm-hmm. a lot of them have a, a tome and the tome has spells. And we were imagining if you like open the book, this like mm-hmm. holograph comes out of the, the the book and it sort of like tells the story and shares everything. So that was sort of the, um, the, the vision of where we wanted to get to. 
Um, and then we we asked ourselves, okay, yeah. there's a lot of players in the space like mm-hmm. Google, Microsoft, and all of that. Has enough changed about the world, both culturally and technologically, mm-hmm. since these tools uh, were conceived that there'd be enough space for a startup to 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 like you know do a lot of damage. Uh, mm-hmm. And the reason I say this is that uh, legacy uh, companies and uh, and new technology don't tend to work that well. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, even though Microsoft kind of was part of inventing the cloud, you mm-hmm. could argue they, they never really transitioned office over to the cloud. Right. Um, or, you know, I was at Facebook and even though we knew about mobile and, you know, tried to think about how to be a mobile first company, um, we couldn't fit, conceive of building a mobile native experience the way mm-hmm. that like Instagram or Snapchat uh, mm-hmm. was. Um, so we were, we were sitting around and, and thinking, well, it, it seems like there's three things that are very different about today versus when Google Slides came out in like 2004, 2006 or something. Mm-hmm. Um, the first and, and sort of almost obvious is that uh, mobile became a thing. <laughs> you know, whether you consume stories at work or in life, uh, we are getting them on Slack, uh, viewing mm-hmm. them on Twitter, looking at them on email. And mm-hmm. I think if you were like building a rectangle, mm-hmm. like that's 16 by nine, uh, mm-hmm. it would be very hard to reimagine that for, mm-hmm. you know, a mobile device with touch or an iPad. So we're like, whatever we build, it needs to be sort of mobile native or mobile first. Mm-hmm. Um, and we think that there's this really long path there because there's also mm-hmm. so many people who, who don't own laptops anymore, right? Mm-hmm. And, and uh, you know, who are young or who are in the developing world. Uh, mm-hmm. So that was a, a key tenant. But the second was um, we sort of had this belief that you know the best stories in the modern world are multimodal. Yeah, and, and what I mean by that is um, you know the, the there's modality in terms of the medium, right? Like video, mm-hmm. image, text, but but also in this age of the internet, you, you should be able to reference different sources of data from around the internet. Like when I when I worked at Facebook or Instagram, all of my decks were screenshots of different web services, you know, screenshot of data, screenshot of customer feedback, screenshot of design files. And we were like, we should build this tool with connecting to different data sources in mind, because I think the best stories are all going to have many different citations and many mm-hmm. different uh, objects being pulled from different sources. Mm-hmm. And it didn't seem like the conventional Slack companies were thinking about that. They were thinking about like this graphic canvas, you know, that you draw. Mm-hmm. So we're like, oh, that feels very fundamental about the way people work and the way people think. And then the, the, the last but certainly not, not least piece was that we um, have this belief that if you read a lot of decks, uh, I went mm-hmm. on SlideShare and I read like 20,000 decks before we started. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, you can... Um, you'll notice that a lot of stories uh, follow a, a, a familiar formula, right? Mm-hmm. Which is to say that a, a lot of pitch decks have a very similar arc. They either use mm-hmm. the Y Combinator arc or the Sequoia mm-hmm. narrative. A lot of product review decks have, follow a very similar arc. And it turns out this is very true about story, storytelling. With a lot of good stories, the, the structure is formulaic. But the way you fill out the details is, is the unique part. And I like to joke that I think every Pixar movie follows a very similar narrative. Structure, but, yeah. Uh, structure, but, but they're all very distinctive in their own way, mm-hmm. right? Um, and <laughs> there was a technology that could connect, sorry, that could read every single story and every single deck in the mm-hmm. world. Uh, and then you could connect to it to build structure for your story that would be transformative, mm-hmm. right? That would be like mm-hmm. crazy transformative. Mm-hmm. And uh, it, it, as, as a thought partner, or, and at, at that time, GPT-2 was a thing mm-hmm. and you could start to see the like semblance of it. We're like, this this mm-hmm. is going to get better. And mm-hmm. we weren't sure if it was going to get better over like two years or five years uh, right into time horizon, but we knew that this was going to be a big part of, of the company. Mm-hmm. So we're like, okay, between mobile, different modalities and web services and uh, honestly advancements in, in large language models, there's enough here, but it's going to be really hard for a big old company to change what they're doing. And we're like, okay, do we think that designing and conceiving a tone from first principles with all of this in mind, can we build something so good that we'll, we can get like a couple of years head start 
and then just run as fast as we can. That was sort of the, the setup um, <laughs> around home. And then, you know, of course, you can't predict exactly when all of these things land, but uh, a, a lot of it has held up to be true so far. You guys were thinking like from the very beginning, like the product side, like people don't want to create something from scratch. People want to work on it, like maybe with some sort of like guidance or like kind of existing format. Then let's like just like re like, you know, recreate like the whole thing from scratch. And then you guys are kind of like AI first product, like so compared to like uh, the big company of the world in general, like people started like, you know, many, many years ago. Now, like people are like adding AI onto their team or like doing stuff like that. I'm curious, like I'm sure maybe like any investor asks you guys, are you know, like what's your defensibility when let's say like, you know, Canva or some like or Microsoft, like someone just like instantly just like insert the technology part into it, especially for like Microsoft, like right, like they invest in open AI, <laughs> like they definitely maybe have like more advantage in terms of like adding AI into it. How do you kind of like solve that problem if like people started doing that? And like what does like thinking AI first like companies like have an advantage compared to like all, all these like, you know, really big companies? When I, when I think about AI first or AI native, I think it's, it's sort of imagining mm -hmm. how do you design and conceive of a product with the mm -hmm. power than the constraints and the limitations in mind. And I, I think uh, one, one sort of obvious piece to this is that um, when you're asking a large language model or an image generation model to, to create something for you, um, it's a very iterative process. You know, it's almost like working with a person where you're having a conversation back and forth to edit and shape and eventually you get something that's very different than being directive. You know, um, mm -hmm. Like when I use a drawing tool, I'm very directive. I'm like put a, a rectangle here and then put an arrow here. So a lot of our thinking in sort of building something AI native is how do you build something that feels sort of conversational, but, but not necessarily conversational in like a chat window, but it could be conversational in the sense mm -hmm. that where we generate something for you and then we give you the tools to drag it, shape it, refine it. And then we take that feedback and it sort of trains the model and, uh, and and then we end up in, in in a different spot. And then we learn things about it. We learn that mm. you know you like to write uh, in a very straightforward or logical way, or we le learn that you like to generate images that sort of have a cyberpunk aesthetic. So then we start to give mm -hmm. you more of what you want. And I, and, mm -hmm. and when I think about that, that's very hard to bolt on to a product that's mm -hmm. like 20 years old. I think a good analogy would be like mm -hmm. if if you drive a Tesla, uh, they had to imagine building. Uh, an electric vehicle with the constraints of uh, of using batteries and electric motors. Right? So you needed to put the batteries on the bottom for a low center of gravity. Mm -hmm. You know, you needed to rebuild a transmission to mm -hmm. think about all of the torque. Uh, and mm -hmm. then you needed to like redesign the instrument panel because you're mm -hmm. going to design drive less and less compared to a classic mm -hmm. car. So when I think about you know how tone feels versus maybe some of those legacy products, th those almost feel like a like a Chevy mm -hmm. Bolt to me. Mm -hmm. It was like a combustion car where they put in an electric motor, and mm -hmm. I think tone feels um, very very different. And um, and you know now we're starting to to sort of compound on um, on those those gains. Um, which is to say, you know, we're um, starting to think about enterprise pilots and uh, a very common ask that we hear from uh, people that are interested in Tome of Enterprise. They're like, you know, we, we're excited to build on top of your large language models, but we also want our own data layer and we want our own mm -hmm. explainability. We want to be able to upload everything from our company's sort of um, repository, you know, documents, mm -hmm charts, uh, data warehouse, and then we want you to use those facts and mm -hmm. those claims and then layer that into sort of the the, the weave of, uh, of like a GPT-4. And, mm -hmm. um, and that's the th sort of thing that actually feels very hard to do unless you're mm -hmm. all in on it, right? So we're sort mm -hmm. of in the, the middle of weaving everything from a company's sort of like intranet into a large language model and tuning it with them 
and and ultimately giving you something that can uh, you know be able to write like you and write like someone at your company. Mm-hmm. You know, certainly a big company could do that mm-hmm. if they wanted, but uh, you know, I think it would be a, a, a very challenging thing to to do as a side project. I heard like so many companies are building upon the technology like GPT four, OpenAI provided, and is GPT four like a AWS or something? Like, why is everyone build mm-hmm. about it? Not why I guess like it is pretty good, but like how hard it is to train your own model and then like okay so let's say if i have a unique you mentioned like tom can help you to like you know leveraging you your unique writing style or to like kind of create a deck for you and let's say like i don't want every deck on the internet i just want like you know let's say like the yc deck that raised like 100 million like how do i kind of insert that layer onto my tom is that possible right now or like are you guys like working on it like how 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 does that work in terms of like technology component i would say the, the first piece is that you know we, we think about using mm-hmm. these foundational models uh like a platform and i think it actually uh is a lot like AWS versus Google mm-hmm. Cloud versus mm-hmm. Azure in the sense that I, I think that there will, will likely look more like an oligopoly versus a monopoly. I, I think that there's going to be you know three to five major players and mm-hmm. they're all advancing so quickly that um, I think you know, many of them are going to be good and, and many mm-hmm. of them will tune for slightly different applications. Mm-hmm. So sort of our view is, as Tom is that, you know, we want to build the best possible experience for our customers. Mm-hmm. And uh, we've sort of built our system so that we can effortlessly swap out between mm-hmm. different models to sort of get the best experience. Um, mm-hmm. Because, you know, even though we're using you know, a model right now for image generation, uh, there's new ones coming out that are way better from different suppliers. And, you know, we never want to be caught not using, you know, the best possible model uh, for for our customers uh, because it is a living space and our ability to iterate and adapt mm-hmm. is pretty key to survival. It, it, it's funny, I, I, right now, the, the focus that we have is around how do we get the a data source for you and your company um, that, that sort of speaks to facts that you want to use over and over again. Yeah. And I think that's sort of the, the highest priority thing. Um, you know, we if you work at a bank, we want you to use your bank's research and facts. Or if you mm-hmm. work at a, uh, like a Web three company, we want you to mm-hmm. talk about your technology, not you know sort of what what, what hallucinates from the, the large language model. I think in terms of style, it's funny we we, we argue about this a lot uh, around you know should we try to make tone sound like you or should we try to make tone just sound good right and <laughs> and um, I, I think where we are right now it's, it's actually more interesting to just make tone sound good and compelling and factual mm-hmm. and uh, i think a lot of the personalization on style will, will probably come um you know a, a little bit later and, and, and to your to your next question around well how do we train how do i train just on you know, the right decks versus the wrong decks? Well, it's a good question. And, and I, I think it's something where um, we're, we're starting to explore in, in the sense that if you go to like the open AI playground, you mm-hmm. can ingest content uh, and as part of your context window. And then mm-hmm. you can train on that content in a really short term way um, and then output something based off of that. And mm-hmm. one of the cool things about GPT-4 is you can get this huge context window, right, of like 25 pages. Um, mm-hmm. So it sort of like has the backdrop of mm-hmm. uh, being able to train on specific things locally. Um, so we're working on a few things with that, which which I think I think you'll you'll find very compelling uh, mm-hmm. over, the, over the coming months. I think like what you guys have done were, you know, I think the product, especially the initial product was like really fabulous. Like Tome passed like a million users in like 134 days after launch. You guys are the fastest like productivity tool that ever reached that milestone, uh, surpassing, you know, Dropbox, Slack, and Zoom. I'm curious, like how does that quick growth happen? So like how do you guys like adapt it so quickly because you mentioned there was like 40 50 version uh, was that before you launched the first product and then like how did people at the beginning like really catch on this like fire to like use this product it's like one thing i wish i could tell myself <laughs> a few years ago is that you know the internet's a really efficient distribution vector 
Um, mm -hmm. And if you build something that truly is 10x better than the a product or solution that people are currently using, it's just going to spread fast on its own. Uh, it's going mm -hmm. to spread on Twitter and on Reddit, it's, uh, on Discord, on, on, mm -hmm. on TikTok. I think your goal as a founder first is to just build a thing that, that truly is 10x better. Well, this is sort of, the, the I think, the case with Tone in, in the sense that, you know, we were doing the... The, the regular things that, that a good go-to-market team would do, which is to say that we were, you know, taking launches seriously. Whenever we launch a feature, we always email our, our existing customers first. We always make a little bit of uh, like a short video that we post on social. And that's really it, you know? And, uh, <laughs> and you know, when, when we um, for sort of first launched the first uh, version of, of Tone Generation, that's just what we did. You know, we, we, we built the first, uh, this version, we got it out. We weren't thinking too deeply about, you know, how to make maximum impact. We were just like this, we think this thing is pretty good. Let's send it out and, and see what happens. And then when we posted this video, uh, you know, it, it went viral very quickly. Uh, mm -hmm. Just to say, I think, uh, you know, Henry and I both posted the video like a week before Christmas. And um, I just kept getting retweeted and retweeted and retweeted. And then uh, influencers were picking it up on TikTok. Uh, and mm -hmm. then, uh, you know, customers were coming in. And uh, that's sort of what, what's, what, what snowballed, uh, which is to say, uh, you know, over the holidays, we, um, you know, we, we took down Okta <laughs> as our off. We uh, were, were running into rate limits with, with open AI. And you could see that, that it was the start of something. Um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and at that point, we, we sort of realized now it's it's our job to just hold on and shape this mm -hmm. thing. Right, we're just to, to say that um, you know now we reach out to, to influencers that cover tone, and we're like, you know, to uh, could, could we work with you to ship our next thing? Or you know, now um, I, I think that the crazy thing that happened in the past few months is that our user base completely changed. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. we went from a few thousand teams who we really knew well, who were like product teams, um, engineering teams, design teams, and now we've we've got a little bit of everyone, and uh, <laughs> I would say that. Uh, one of our, our biggest challenges internally is like how do how do we prioritize what's next? Because mm. we have you know everyone from authors to students to CTOs to founders to product managers all asking for different things. So 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 we're we're sort of in this this uh, hard prioritization path. You guys had like a really successful raise. You guys raised like a, a forty three million recently, and then at a three hundred million dollar valuation. You guys had like all these like really famous investors and stuff like that. And before that, like, what does like a fund fundraising journey look like for you? And then also, what does like the business model look like? I know you guys plan on charging like ten dollar per user for like a monthly fee, and then there's like enterprise and stuff like that. So I think maybe a lot of the decision coming out of you know what do we build next maybe coming out of like, you know, either the adoption side, like, you know, who can adopt the fastest in terms of like monetization? What's your like outlook on that? Yeah, early fundraising. And I mean, it's still very early. Mm -hmm. We've only been around for, you know, a little over two years. Mm -hmm. uh, but every time we fundraise, we, we we both came to the realization that we um we can never convince an investor of something that they didn't already believe. And um, I'm sure other founders have had a, um, a different experience with this, but at least for us, you know, for us, it was really about finding investors and, and board members who, who kind of believe the same things that we did about the technology, about the space, about the go to market. And mm -hmm. honestly, just finding them as quickly as possible and then spending as little time as possible with people mm -hmm. who believe different things. You know, mm -hmm. so I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, you know, we on purpose have a very consumer focused go to market. Mm. Which is to say, we, we sort of believe that we're, we're going to have the best shot at building an enduring company by mm -hmm. building something that, that's, that's always free to, to use, um, that sort of grows organically from people sharing tones on the internet. And we're, we're convinced that if you take it into work with you, one one day you'll, you'll want to pay for it. And we, we, we think that that bottoms up consumer go-to-market motion is just the, the best way to build an enduring company because it gives us a shot to sort of overcome the giant sales teams at mm -hmm. some of the incumbent public companies. Uh, so we, we started to fundraise multiple times and we found that, you know, 
really sophisticated consumer investors understood this. They were like, mm -hmm. well, talk about the network effect, we can talk about virality, and talk about uh, sort of the, the, the engagement-based retention metrics, and um, talk about how you think this, you can make this thing grow. And for them, it was sort of the but it felt very obvious, you know, mm -hmm. sort of like really lightweight, mobile friendly format that mm -hmm. you could use AI to, to, to make lots of. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think because of that, we found some people that believed the same things as us. And mm -hmm. for them, it was very, um, it was very uh, sort of fast and obvious. The other thing is we, we found investors who actually use the product uh, tended to believe mm -hmm. in us a little more than ones that were trying to like read the opportunity. So so that, that was sort of an interesting learning. And I think one of the hard things about a company like ours is that you, you sort of need to build horizontally and think about vertical go to market at the same time, right? Mm -hmm. Which is to say that you know, I don't know what persona a text editor is for. You know, I don't really know what persona mm -hmm. uh, like a diagram system is for. It's kind of for everyone. So you need to be really comfortable building for a lot of people horizontally and I'm confident that you'll mm -hmm. figure out the, the vertical insertion into enterprises later. And we found that uh, um, you know, not, not everyone in Silicon Valley sort of believes in that. So it was a matter of <laughs> The, the believers and uh, and really getting to know them um mm -hmm. you know in, in terms of you know what's next and what's driving things uh we are going to start charging soon you know we're, we're always going to have a free version tone we, we you know it's core to who we are uh you know we don't want to charge students we want to give them mm -hmm. tome and let them run with it but the reason that we're, we're going to start charging soon is that we uh uh, we have some big exciting things that are going to be coming to our pro tier you know something that a lot of our customers ask about is like how do i uh, how do i get unlimited compute you know mm -hmm. uh, i don't want to think about if i'm running out of credits to perform different operations i just want to have access to compute when I need it, when I'm building an important presentation. And I feel that way too. I don't want to think about credits uh, when I'm doing work. So that's one of the reasons that we're building a pro tier. And one of the other reasons that we're building a pro tier is it sort of helps us understand um, you know, who's really serious about using the tool, right? Mm -hmm. Because there's clearly people who use Tome every day and they make lots of Tomes, but that's different than who's going to be paying every month. And I think mm -hmm. it'll sort of help us um, focus on the, the right per personas and, and focus the, the roadmap. You know, I, I think something that we talk about internally is we we want to mature to be in an, an enterprise company, but sort of at the right rate and at the right pace. Mm -hmm. Because I think if you prematurely focus on enterprises and teams, mm -hmm. You, uh, you sort of lose your magic as a startup of being able to get build this thing that gets to scale that people love. Um, and you, I think you get hyper-focused on like enterprise specific mm -hmm. features. Um, so, you know, we are thinking about what does enterprise tome look like? And we're starting mm -hmm. to experiment a little, but I, I think we're we're never going to lose sight of the fact that we're, we're a consumer company at heart. I'm curious, like when you just like started, like, you know, when you were raising funding for that very, very beginning, did mm -hmm. Tome already look like what it is today? Or like, it does it do what it does today? And what does like the AI landscape look like back then? Because um, you know, you guys started like I, I believe it was like two years ago, and which is like now, like AI is the thing. When I think about fundraising, I, I think you you just have you have, you have to be really honest about what you have and really honest mm -hmm. about what you need to build next. And you know, what we had at the earliest stage is that we, we had really great looking prototypes. You know, we mm -hmm. did. I mean, Henry is an incredible product person. He he mm -hmm. sort of mapped out the whole thing in Figma, built all of these prototypes, mm -hmm. uh, showed what the functionality could look like with visuals and with a movie. Um, and then I did a bunch of customer research. Uh, I ran like a survey on SpayMonkey. Mm -hmm. uh, I called <laughs> a bunch of I called a bunch of potential customers and recorded them on Zoom mm -hmm. and, and, and sort of ask them, you know, how do you feel about PowerPoint and, you know, what would it take for you to use a new tool? And I think, you know, we try to present this case that, you know, we know exactly what we're going to do with this. And honestly, we just need to build it. And mm -hmm. I, I think that that really resonated with a bunch of investors and, and, it, and it sort of worked out. From the note of the AI stuff, you, you know, it's funny, I, I'm going to take this quote from, I think, the, the Stripe CEO. It's, it's just very hard to predict what's going to happen in the next year or the next three years. But you can sort of 
predict with higher precision what's going to happen over the next 10 years. Mm-hmm. And, and I really feel that way. Like, I have no idea what the economy is going to look like next year. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, mm-hmm. I have a, a sense of what the economy could look like in 10 years. And, mm-hmm. you know, for that perspective, I, I think you, you just need to have conviction about what does the next decade look like and then build conservatively and sort of wait for the timing to line up. We knew that large language models and um, honestly machine translation were going to be a huge part of Tome, but we sort of designed Tome with that from the beginning, but we weren't sure if it would be possible in 2022. Mm-hmm. 2024 2026 or maybe 2029 um so with, with that in mind we're like let's have a small team let's build the things that we know we need to build and let's you know keep keep our eyes on the pulse let's like pay attention to what's happening with all of the like you know forks of stability what's happening on a hugging face and at some point this is going to feel obvious uh, mm-hmm. And, you know, it started to, to really feel obvious last year. You started the company with your co-founder when you guys were two people. And then now you guys have like 45 people. And how does it look like on the talent side? So, for example, like in terms of percentage, like how many are engineers, how many are designers, how many are like sales or like business people? Like as a CEO, like what go through your mind when designing your team? It's all like, okay, so... When you hire like the core product person and they're like, okay, so we need like 10 people to build X, Y, Z. And then this is like how we budget. And like, or like, do you just go with like, okay, this is my general vision. We're going to sell like X amount of dollar in 2023. And then this is like how we're going to do it by getting 10 people in this team, that team. Like, do you start from like the bottom up or like the top down? I, I think the answer is always both, which is to, to <laughs> say that, uh, and I think we're, we're 38 right now. You know, we, we obviously built a very simple, Google Sheet, where we realized mm-hmm. the max number of people we can hire. And then you know, we, we sort of took it day by day. And uh, and Reed on our own had sort of had this philosophy. It was like, when you're starting a company, just try to hire one great person a month. Mm-hmm. And then next month, try to hire someone better than them. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and he was like, at, at some point, uh, it's going to get harder and harder to hire because you're going to have this like incredible... A, like incredibly talented yeah. team and that's sort of the like control mechanism it, because as a startup you know you're uh you're, you're trying to convince people to take a chance on you so it's usually rate limited by the number of great people you can find versus like how much you can afford so, so we always have this perspective of you know we have a max we we like small teams you know we, we sort of like our our size and we think that you can always do more or less but let's be really precise about the next one to three hires and then let's keep reassessing because you just get so much new information as a founder in the early stages right like your user base might completely change next week all of your customers might churn the week after uh you Mm -hmm. might be dealing with like an infrastructure fire the week after so because so much is changing I, i don't find it that helpful to be too rigorous with the crazy planning ahead mm-hmm. for months and months. And I've just really focused on, am I making the best decision on the next hire? Since you guys raised like a really pretty big, decent size run this time, like what are you planning on like spending money on? Like, is that like developing the newest technology, grow the team or like, uh, you know, how does that look like for you? I mean, I would say we're, we're a technology and product company. So we're putting a lot of that um into you know building out our machine learning Mm -hmm. team we're putting it into building out our design and product and engineering team and um you know that's always been the heart of tome uh i I think Mm -hmm. tome has always felt like a place where people come to build things that they're proud of you know we always say that you know you should be building the best work of your life at Toe uh, compared to the previous company. So, mm-hmm. so that's, that's going to be a, a heavy investment. Um, mm-hmm. That being said, you know, we are turning into a company, right? Which is just <laughs> thing that we've got um, a, a lot more users than we did a few months ago. We're turning on payments. We're exploring enterprise. So we're, we're sort of hiring um, this really small and really high powered uh, go to market team to help um, so, sort of round things out. Um, but the, the, the goal, it's funny, we, um, you know, the, the goal is to stay as small as possible for as long as possible in the sense that there's something magic about um, being roughly 40, which is that there really are no layers of management. Um, so I, I think there's this like efficiency with how everyone has the same context. Uh, everyone, you know, owns a good 
good chunk of the company because mm -hmm. of the way we think about compensation. Um, you know, and we're we're all really focused and we're all really sort of aligned on the mission. And uh, to to me, this is like the one of the most fun parts of building a company to sort mm -hmm. of uh, embrace this size. And uh, and I think we're going to try to stay in this range for as long as possible. What does the future of work look like for you? And in terms of like right now, like a popular topic, whenever I'm posting something about AI on LinkedIn, people are always commenting like there's like half of people like loves it, like who are, you know, passionate about like the future. And then there's the other half of people are like, yeah, it's going to take over our job. What is your perspective on that? Like, and then what kind of impact will it make on the future of work? I would say Tom's view on this is that we we don't really believe in this idea of an AI doing your entire job. It, 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 we, we really believe in this narrative of, of AI being um, a tool of human amplification, which is that we, we help we help you be great and sort of achieve your dreams better, faster, more efficiently. Mm -hmm. and, and that's sort of the, the thing we're excited about, like in the sense that it doesn't matter how much data you train on. Uh, a machine is never going to be able to build a pitch deck for you without intervention because so much of mm -hmm. a pitch deck is your vision. It's your imagination. It's the company that you want to build, right? And the mm -hmm. best that a co-pilot can do is sort of give you examples of things that have worked, give you examples mm -hmm. of structure that generally works, but it's sort of up to you as the human to like take it, refine it, shape mm -hmm. it, and turn it in, into, into your thing. So that's what we're excited about, you know, when I, when I think about the, the future of work. And the reason that we focus on storytelling is that I, I think um, you know, storytelling is sort of the the elementary building block of productivity in the sense that the way that I convince you to work on something with me is I tell you a great story. Sometimes it involves mm -hmm. facts, sometimes it involves visuals, and that's how I convince mm -hmm. you to work on it with me. So I think about storytelling as this, this precursor to alignment, and we need alignment to work together uh, on, on big, hard things. So, you know, the reason that we thought Tome was a mm -hmm. generational company and the reason that we're we're dedicated to it is that we, we believe that if we can help everyone tell or anyone tell a compelling story we think that you know the best ideas will win we think that society will will, will cooperate on those ideas and um and, and that's what i'm really really excited about like when i think about sort of misinformation on the internet you know i think we talk a little bit about the filter bubble um, and that's a big part of it. We only hear and see people who believe the same things as us. But, but I think the other side of it is that we don't have a great medium to talk about complex ideas uh, with each other. And, and I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, Tome gets a, a step in the right direction of being able to, to talk about comp complex things with nuance. Uh, so, so hopefully that applies to the workplace too. Okay, so we're at the last part of the interview, which is that mini fire round. Okay, so number one is like, what's your favorite book? Ooh, uh, the, the three body problem, the, the first one. Who made the biggest impact in your career? I would say our, our first investor, uh, Reed Hoffman, uh, has a huge impact on, on, on Tome. And I think Tome is how I think about my career. <laughs> Wait, so how did he like discover you? And like, how, how are you guys like getting connected? Because that's like pretty huge. Yeah, I was able to join Block because of um, uh, an investor, Seth, who worked with me at Facebook. And, uh, and Seth sort of convinced the partnership that I was worth taking a chance on. And then once I worked there, I just kept putting time on Reed's calendar every <laughs> week. Uh, you're like, hey, can you help me think through this idea? Can you help me, you know, convince Henry to work on this with us? Uh, and I think we just kept re repeating and showing him work. And after a while, it was like, all right, fine. I'll, I'll work on this thing with you. It seems like you guys are really, really focused on this problem. And, and, and maybe there's something here. So, okay. So back to the rapid fire. Uh, who would you invite to your dinner party? Um, I mean, I, I think a good dinner party has, has good balance. You know, so I would want to invite um you know a scientist you know i would want to invent invite uh you know an entrepreneur i would want to invite you know hopefully an artist and uh and we would try to try to get them all to to hang out with each other amazing uh where can we find you outside of work uh so i, I live in the bay area um mm -hmm. so you know i'm hiking on weekends uh i'm you know, really into car racing because I love the adrenaline and when you know you're, you're going at 130 140 miles an hour you can't be thinking about tone for a couple of seconds. 
That's crazy. Okay, so if you're an Android investing in one company, which one would you invest in? That that is a great question. One of the things that I'm really excited about, or an area I'm really excited about, is、um, for using、um, generative AI to design interfaces. Uh, and to design sort of communication work for like Instagram for prints, and I think that there's there's an idea out there of you know being able to rebuild Photoshop, you know, <laughs> using using AI or rebuild Figma using AI, and I would be incredibly curious and excited to 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 back someone、uh, who is passionate and about that space and yearns to solve that problem because I think there, there's something giant there. Totally, I totally agree. Maybe you can build it after. <laughs> <laughs> After this year, but well, Keith, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show today. Oh, thank you. I really enjoyed it.